E qua con noi oggi pomeriggio ad ascoltare eh, Richard Stallman, sappiamo un personaggio molto, molto conosciuto. Io mi presento, sono Stefano D'Artifoppa, sono direttore della rivista 01 e insieme a eh, Finati abbiamo organizzato questo, questo incontro con eh, una serie di obiettivi. Eh, per chi non ci conosce, noi eh, siamo all'interno del panorama editoriale italiano un soggetto che ha un'articolazione di proposta in termini di uh, approfondimenti di tematiche legate all'evoluzione della, uh, della CT, all'evoluzione del digitale all'interno delle aziende e soprattutto nel rapporto che queste aziende hanno con il mercato attraverso la digitalizzazione. Quindi il nostro obiettivo con questo tipo di, uh, di incontri è quello di uh, riuscire a contribuire ad una crescita della consapevolezza del contesto nel quale le aziende poi oggi eh, si muovono e si trovano ad operare. Quindi la tematica eh, che oggi andremo attraverso Richard a, eh, ad analizzare è una tematica, come sapete, eh, fondamentale che dal punto di vista di Richard parte dalla prospettiva del free software ma si estende a quello che è il contesto della libertà individuale all'interno di una società eh, sempre più connessa, sempre più integrata con sempre più dati. In più uno degli elementi interessanti che dalla prospettiva di Richard vengono, eh, si possono derivare dai ragionamenti e, dalla, e dalle azioni tra l'altro molto coerenti che, che, che Richard con, con la sua azione sta portando avanti sul mercato è quella della consapevolezza di una totale eh, dipendenza rispetto a quelli che sono oggi eh, gli oggetti e eh, le modalità collaborative di connessione che abbiamo. Quindi sentire da una prospettiva di ehm, propugnare una possibilità di muoversi in modo più libero e meno controllato, meno coordinato, meno eh, vincolato all'interno della società digitale verso cui stiamo andando, questo ci può consentire sia come soggetti individuali sia come aziende soprattutto di credo che i valori stia proprio in questa possibilità di riparametrare un po' la nostra corsa verso la digitalizzazione, cioè sentire perlomeno questo è il mio pensiero, sentire un personaggio come Richard parlare di free software nella società odierna ci consente di ritarare un po' meglio quella che è la nostra corsa alla digitalizzazione spinta, perlomeno essere consapevoli di quelli che possono essere i condizionamenti e le fragilità che una società di questo tipo può portare. Quindi, prima di lasciare la parola a Richard, che citerà una vera e propria Lexio Magistralis, lascio la parola al dottor Giorgio Buongiorno che come Finati insieme a noi organizza questo incontro prego Giorgio salute a tutti io chiamandomi Buongiorno non ho, ho qualche problema verso sera evidentemente quindi scusatemi eh, io credo che siamo qui e mi fa piacere di vedere eh, tutti voi a celebrare dei valori io credo che al di là di tutti gli aspetti tecnologici, gli aspetti diciamo, legati all'information technology, qui abbiamo un personaggio che l'ha eh, incorporata, vorrei dire, dalla, dalla nascita, no? quindi eh, è sicuramente un valore a sé stante per questa ragione. Ma io volevo puntualizzare un valore umano e io credo siamo in tempi in cui i valori umani incominciano a riprendere faticosamente il loro cammino. Eh, io ho avuto modo di conoscere Richard da tempo e di apprezzare la coerenza con cui eh, tutta quanta la sua vita è, e la sua missione, a questo punto possiamo dire, ve ne accorgerete dal modo in cui eh, che lui usa per esprimere questa sua missione è sicuramente in se stessa una serie di valori che noi abbiamo incominciato a perdere ad iniziare dalla coerenza dei nostri comportamenti rispetto al mondo circostante ecco io non voglio togliere tempo vi voglio soltanto dire che eh, noi rappresentiamo e stiamo rappresentando c'è qui anche il presidente europeo della della, della Finachi abbiamo rappresentato ormai da una ventina d'anni la voce dell'information dell technology management europeo sia in Germania, in Francia da dove è nato, in Italia 
e a livello europeo. Abbiamo cercato di istituzionalizzare la voce del digitale a livello nazionale prima ed europeo poi, con l'intento e con l'ambizione di poter finalmente interferire in quelli che sono gli aspetti decisionali dell'information technology che sono stati sempre un po' monopolizzati dai, dai vendor ovviamente no? che hanno un certo peso in questa, in questa vicenda ecco noi abbiamo cercato di dar voce ai CIO ai Chief Information Officers che sono l'espressione più eh, diciamo più, più viva della domanda e quindi dell'attualità di questa domanda e quindi delle priorità che a questa domanda sono associate. E noi abbiamo piacere, evidentemente ci serviamo per i nostri eventi anche della sponsorizzazione, ma non sicuramente in assoluto della sponsorizzazione, perché eh, questa voce deve avere evidentemente tutta l'indipendenza che eh, le spetta in modo tale da poter esprimere determinate opinioni che non sempre sono in linea con quelle del mercato o con quelle che il mercato in qualche modo suggerisce, diciamo suggerisce fra virgolette, penso che si, si capisca. Bene, quindi non voglio togliere, questo è il nostro ruolo, abbiamo appunto da, da una ventina d'anni, 25 per la verità in Francia, 14 in Italia per esempio, abbiamo espresso la voce di questa, di questa particolare categoria di manager io credo che oggi insieme io tutte le volte che ho sentito Richard è un'esperienza di vita io eh, spero che oggi sia un'altra di quelle tappe che eh, sicuramente ci hanno arricchito dentro nel senso dello spirito e anche dal punto di vista tecnologico per quelle che sono gli sforzi di questa software foundation che penso tutti quanti voi conoscerete do la parola come solo eh, lo speech di, di, di Richard dura circa un'ora e mezza alle 18.30 dopodiché se volete avremo una sessione di domande e risposte alle quali appunto uh, Richard potrà rispondere hey, Rich. Rich? that's your time that's your time on stage oh ok io ho avuto modo di, eh, di cenare con lui parecchie volte ed è una cosa simpatica perché c'è sempre un PC da qualche parte, qualche volta ce ne sono anche due, con due fa fatica ovviamente a usare i normali suppellettili per una cena. Eh? Ok. Uh, you understand Italian, so I don't no, know. I, don't, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I sometimes understand Italian if it's similar to enough. It, if I can get it via French and Spanish, <laughs> then I'll understand. But uh, in general, no, I don't. So, <clears throat> Possiamo farlo anche tutti in termini di coerenza. Do you need the mic? Well, I don't know. Do I need the mic? Yes, you need the mic. Okay. Please raise your hands if you cannot hear me. <laughs> to start, some requests for you. First, if you take a photo of me, please do not put it in Facebook or Instagram. <laughs> I want no photos of me in Facebook or Instagram because that company is a monstrous surveillance engine. And it, it does surveillance in more ways than you are probably know. It does surveillance on its used and it does surveillance on its non-used as well. I don't call them users. I call them used because Facebook is the one using them. Uh, <clears throat> in fact, if you put a photo of your friend in Facebook, we could dispute whether that's decent treatment of your friend. 
But if I'm not your friend, that doesn't <laughs> relate to, to photos of me. However, putting photos of me into Facebook would hurt me. And Facebook keeps upgrading its face recognition capability. So giving, we could say that posting anything about someone other than you in any social network is treating people badly. You shouldn't do that and you should object if anyone does it to you. <clears throat> so don't post photos of me in Facebook or Instagram. There is one exception of something that is done publicly, like my speech, well, that's not a private, so it's okay if you talk about that on more decent social networks. It's things that, are, that other people are doing privately that you shouldn't post about. <clears throat> and second, if you make a recording of this talk and you want to distribute copies, for instance, I see a video is being made, please do so only Please distribute them only in the formats that are favorable to free software, such as the OGG formats or WebM, not in MP anything, and <laughs> especially, yeah, yeah, there's enough, fine, but please just don't distribute in those formats. Convert it first. <laughs> um, sure. And especially not uh, <laughs> in Flash or <laughs> QuickTime uh, and make sure that whatever site you use to distribute the copies does not in normal use lead people to run non-free software. So this means there are two reasons not to put it in YouTube because one, in one mode of use YouTube distributes through Flash and in the other mode, it distributes WebM, which is a good format, but requires people to run non-free JavaScript code to get it, which is not right. And please put on the video the license Creative Commons No Derivatives, because this is a presentation of my point of view. So, you will see many programs that aim for digital inclusion or closing the digital divide and they presume that giving people access to the internet bringing them including them in a digital society is necessarily good well i don't agree i don't think it's necessarily good it can be good or it can be bad depending on the nature of the digital society we are including people in if it's a just digital society that respects the freedoms of the people in it, then inclusion in it is good. If it's an unjust, oppressive digital society, then participation in it is bad. And the proper goal is not digital inclusion, but rather our digital extraction. So, what makes the digital society just or unjust, free or non-free? What are the threats to our freedom in the digital society. I will discuss 10 different threats. First, surveillance. Thanks to a great hero, Edward Snowden, we now know that we are subject to far more surveillance than the inhabitants of the former Soviet Union. Three cheers for Edward Snowden. Hip, hip, Hurrah! Hip, hip, hurrah! Hip, hip, hurrah! So it's important to say that every time it's relevant. There are people trying to demonize him, saying he should be assassinated. Well, we should work hard to say that we appreciate and admire this hero. <clears throat> so, surveillance is everywhere in the digital society. And it's not just on the internet. Some of it's on the internet. But there are other forms of digital surveillance. Now, the surveillance is done directly by governments. It's also done by companies, such as Facebook. But actually, there isn't that much of a difference, because whatever data the companies collect is then available to governments. Go 
good. Thank you. So <clears throat> you could think of each company that collects uh, data about people as another tentacle of Big Brother, another eye. <clears throat> Now, sometimes the surveillance is done through people's own computers, their own digital products. Often, they collect data about people. <clears throat> and this is done when the software in the device is not free. In other words, it's not under the control of the users. In this case, we describe it as spyware. And spyware is quite common among proprietary software. Now, you can prevent that by insisting on devices in which all the software is free, liberal. But that's not the only way they snoop on people. They also do it through systems that we don't own, but that we make use of. For instance, if you connect your computer to the internet, you have to use an ISP. The ISPs snoop on their users too. For instance, In Europe, they're required to keep a list of all the internet contacts that the user makes and keep it for some length of time, but they might keep it a lot longer even. Well, these dossiers are massive surveillance of everyone. With And phone companies do the same thing. They keep a list of all the person's phone contacts. And if it's a mobile phone, they keep lists of geolocations where the phone was. Somebody in Germany asked his phone company to hand over its records about his own locations. The phone company refused, probably said it was protecting his privacy. So he went to court and forced it to hand over 35,000 location points for a period of six months. That's almost 200 a day which means every few minutes, which gives a pretty good picture of a person's life. And we can't prevent that kind of snooping on us by insisting on free software. I hope that the phone company and the ISP are running free software because otherwise some other company has power over them which is an injustice towards them. For the ISP's sake, I hope it's escaped from proprietary software, but that has nothing to do with our freedom. The ISP's computers don't belong to us. We would never have and can't expect to have control over the ISP's computers. But we should be concerned when they don't respect our privacy. And then there are the digital systems designed solely for surveillance. For instance, license plate recognition cameras. The United Kingdom has deployed so many license re plate recognition cameras that they can track all car travel, and they do. This I read in a newspaper 10 years ago that they had announced that they were tracking all car travel. They can save a list of all the sightings of the cars and look up where a certain car was five years ago at a particular time and where it went that week. They can also track a car in real time. This is oppression. Now, what makes surveillance so dangerous? Because it's a threat to democracy. Democracy means that the people control what the state does. But in order to control that, we need to know what the state does. States do things secretly. How can we find out? Who watches the watchman? Now we know the answer to this famous old question. Whistleblowers watch the watchman. Heroes like Edward Snowden and others. So we depend on whistleblowers to have democracy. But the state will go to tremendous lengths to punish whistleblowers. 
It will investigate everything they ever said or did to find an excuse to put them in prison. Or it will label the whistleblowing itself as a crime. If the state can find the whistleblower, it will make that person's life hell. So, if we want to have plenty of whistleblowers, we need to prevent the state from doing that. We need to make sure that the state usually can't identify the whistleblowers. In other words, usually can't identify journalists' sources. A few years ago, a U.S. official speaking to people at a, a national security journalism conference said, we're not going to have to subpoena reporters' uh, source material. We know who you're talking to. Meaning, they'll find the sources without the reporter's help by tracking all communication. In the U.S., it's almost impossible for two people to communicate without this being known, or any place else that the NSA is snooping. So that's what we have to change. We have to reduce the amount of surveillance of people in general to the point where it is not sufficient for them to identify the whistleblowers. It has to be less than the Soviet Union had, instead of far, far more. Of course, they say that they do this surveillance to keep us safe, but who do we really need to be kept? Who do we really need to be safe from? Above all, we need to be safe from uh, rogue behavior by the state. We need to maintain our control over what the state is doing. And that depends on whistleblowers. So, we must redesign the digital systems of the world so that they don't collect data about people in general. I recognize the need in certain cases to investigate someone, but that has to be justified by a court which says who to investigate. What we have to stop is the practice of snooping on people in general in the absence of any court order to investigate them. And that's what's going on now. So the problem is not that the state can investigate people, it's massive general surveillance of people's activities, movements, and communications. So, we need to design digital systems so that they don't make a dossier about everyone, so that when the state decides we want to find out who talked with that reporter, it can't find out. There's no data to find out with. I've written an article with many technical suggestions and more arguments. It's gnu.org slash philosophy slash surveillance vs democracy dot html. It's also dissidents that are in danger from state surveillance because it's not unusual for states to sabotage protests and even collaborate directly with companies that people are protesting against. For instance, in the UK, suspected protesters believed to be on the way to a protest were tracked in their car through this system of license plate recognition and then sort of arrested temporarily by thugs who let them go when the protest was over. Well, this shows how surveillance helps the state attack democracy. The next threat, oh, we, one thing we need to do to resist the surveillance is learn not to be inordinately scared of minor dangers. Yes, there are terrorists in the world, but 
the level of danger in the United States or in Italy <coughs> from terrorists is pretty small, and there are other dangers that are much bigger, uh, like dangers from the state going to war. Uh, some terrorists uh, killed around 3,000 Americans in September 2011, 2001, and then uh, the United States kill, government killed four and a half thousand by conquer, Americans by conquering Iraq, and that's not to mention the several hundred thousand Iraqis that it killed. Uh, what's the real danger we should be scared of, right? Uh, if we are, not only that, but cars killed 4,000 Americans in September 2001, and again in October and November and December and every month since then. But somehow politicians don't declare a global war on car accidents. The point is that there's a human tendency to be over concerned about certain, certain deaths and insufficiently concerned about others. People are not concerned enough about the deaths caused by air pollution or the deaths that are going to be caused by global heating. I saw a, a, a study that predicted 100 million people will be call, killed by global heating by 2030. And of course, since global heating is going to keep getting worse, the numbers will keep getting bigger. Anyway, this is something we need to learn to resist so that we can focus on the big dangers and on the things we need most, such as democracy and human rights. The next threat to our freedom is censorship. Censorship is not new, but 15 years ago, it looked like the internet would put an end to censorship. It seemed that it would be too hard to censor the internet. Well, now we know that any state can censor the internet if it's willing to go to enough trouble and stimulate enough resentment from the people. And it's not just obvious tyrannies like China and Iran that, uh, that censor the internet. Uh, you'll find a massive censorship of the internet in Pakistan, which has put on filters blocking access to lots of things. Now, Pakistan is to some extent a democracy, but doesn't respect human rights. Uh, <clears throat> then there is Finland. In 2006, I believe, Finland imposed mandatory filters on the internet. Somebody decided to experiment to find out what was being blocked. He just tried accessing various sites and noted down which ones were blocked and published a list. They blocked access to his site too. Now this is interesting because his site was in Finland. They didn't try to take it down because this was obviously lawful journalism. But they blocked access to it anyway. He went to court. And last year, the Finnish Supreme Court ruled in favor of blocking access to his site. You can see it from outside Finland. It's only blocked in Finland. Now, that is, it's only the victims of this censorship that are being prevented from finding out about it. Now, he hasn't tried to update the site. It no longer provides up-to-date information about what's blocked in Finland, but he leaves it up just to prove the point about, about censorship. <clears throat> and many European countries practice censorship of the internet. I believe there are sites that are, have been ordered blocked in Italy as well as France and Spain. <clears throat> However, it's the UK that's really plunging into censorship. 
four, about four or five years ago, Turkey imposed mandatory filters and announced that there would be that, that every internet user would have to choose between censorship and more censorship and even more censorship and yet more censorship. Four levels of censorship, but access to the internet in the real internet would not be allowed in Turkey. Well, now the UK is following the same path. Uh, first, they said there would be uh, optional censorship of things that have to do with sex including uh, counseling sites as well as porn sites. And they said that you could, it would be optional. You could decide whether to turn it on or off if you've got your own internet connection. But if you're not that wealthy, if you're using public access sites, then this is just mandatory censorship. You can't escape. And then they said they would block other kinds of material that they consider indecent and it's becoming a, a totally oppressive censorship state. There are other kinds of censorship of the internet. I've been talking about filters. Australia does not have filters but it has censorship of links. This means that there are certain sites it is forbidden to link to. Electronic Frontiers Australia was ordered to remove a link to a foreign political website on pain of a fine of $11,000 a day. And what was this website? Was it a terrorist site? No. It was something almost as nasty. It was an anti-abortion rights website totally disgusting, but they have a right to present their views, even in Australia. In India, sites that are considered to offend someone's religion can be arbitrarily taken down. In many countries, no trial is required to order websites shut down. India is one of them. So, censorship of the internet is spreading around the world. And every act of censorship threatens human rights. I've seen works that I found disgusting. For instance, there was a movie called Pulp Fiction which I found disgusting. If I had known what it would be like, I wouldn't have seen it. I will choose not to see anything that that director makes. I don't want to be disgusted by it. But I am against censoring disgusting works because censorship is even more disgusting. Censorship is more disgusting than any work might be. And censorship of any political position attacks everyone's human rights. And you know that once they get finished banning one political position from the net, they'll go after another and another. Freedom of, respecting freedom of speech means really respecting freedom to say the things we disagree with. The next threat to our freedom comes from data formats that restrict users or endanger <coughs> users. In some cases, it's because they're secret. There are programs that you, obviously there are not free programs, that use secret data formats. And why are these formats secret? To restrict users. For instance, there are applications that will save the user's own data in secret formats. I think these include uh, AutoCAD and Quicken and uh, some Adobe programs. So you enter your data, if you're fool enough to be using these non-free programs, you enter your data and then you can only use it in, in that program. Well, this is obviously what the programs developer wants, that users should be uh, captive. 
We call these digital handcuffs. Then there are the formats used for distributing publications, secret formats. Again, to restrict users, typically so that they can't do certain obvious natural things that, of course, people want to do with these, with these works. <clears throat> this is also known as DRM, Digital Restrictions Management. Those who perpetrate it use a term uh, for spin purposes, they call it digital rights management. That term spins it in their direction, and if you don't agree with them, why help them? So that's why I call it digital restrictions management. From the point of view of the company inflicting it, it's digital rights management. From the point of view of the users that are the victims, it's digital restrictions management. So both of these terms have a point of view. Choose your point of view and choose your term. Which, which point of view do you want to support? There is no obvious way to be neutral. <clears throat> so, these are an injustice and I think that the practice of DRM ought to be illegal. But it isn't and it's quite common in non-free software. It has to be in non-free software. You see, if a free program is published which supports a given data format, you can see what the format is by looking at the source code. It's not secret anymore. So if they want to keep the format secret, they must do, use non-free software to do so, which means they're attacking the user's freedom at two levels at once. The non-free program is an attack on user's freedom, and the specific functionality of DRM is another attack at a different level on the user's freedom. Then there are the patented formats. For instance, the MP formats. They're not secret, they're published standards, but uh, typically they are patented, which means that implementing them in free software can be dangerous. You could get sued. And as a result, there are some GNU slash Linux distributions that come with no support for those formats and others that come with proprietary software to support those formats. And some distros put in the free software to support those formats. They think that, that they probably won't be sued. So uh, the, the danger of these is not as much as it seemed to be a few years ago because some of the non-commercial GNU slash Linux distros include the software to support these formats. Still, it's better to avoid them. And then there's the peculiar case of Flash, which, aside from one part of the format, which is specifically designed for digital restrictions management, it's not secret. And it's also not patented as far as we know. It's just that Adobe has redesigned the the data format from zero several times and this makes it so much work to write another implementation that we were never able to catch up. So you really shouldn't have any flash in a website and if a website has flash you should complain. The next threat to our freedom in the digital society comes from non-free software. In other words, <clears throat> proprietary software. Now, the English word free is ambiguous, but there's no better word to use in English. So, when I speak English, I have to explain that it's free as in freedom, not as in price. I don't mean gratis software. Price is a, is a detail, a side issue, which there's no need to talk about. It's not important enough. <clears throat> so I mean software that respects users' freedom and community. In Italian, it's clearer. You say software libero. 
and you, you have a word that means free as in freedom and doesn't mean gratis, so take advantage of it. Don't use the English word free when you're speaking or writing in Italian. Use the unambiguous word you've got. We are starting to use the French or Spanish word libre, I'm pronouncing it anglicized, uh, as a way of saying free as in freedom to make it more clear. Now, when a program is not free, we call it non-free, proprietary, user-subjugating software. <clears throat> With software, there are just two possibilities. Either the users control the program, or the program controls the users. It's always one or the other. The first case is free software. Because in order for the users to control the program, to have this control, they need the four essential freedoms which define free software. Freedom zero is the freedom to run the program as you wish, for whatever purpose. And freedom one is the freedom to study the program's source code and change it to make the program f function for you and do your computing the way you wish. These two freedoms are enough to give each user separately control over the program because you're free to change it and make it do what you, what you want it to do. But this separate control is not enough. First of all, because most users don't know how to program. They're not programmers, they do something else. So they don't know how to exercise freedom one. They don't know how to study and understand the source code or change it. But even for a programmer like me, freedom one is not enough because each person is busy doing a few things and nowadays you will use hundreds or thousands of programmers and no person, no human being has the time to study and master the code of that many programs nor to personally write all the changes she might want. So, <clears throat> We need more, we need collective control over the program, which means that any group of users are free to work together to exercise control, to make the program do what they together wanted to do. That requires the other two essential freedoms. Freedom two is the freedom to make exact copies and redistribute them to others when you wish. Now this includes giving them away or selling them, you're free to do either one. And freedom three is the freedom to make copies of your modified versions and distribute them to others when you wish. These two freedoms allow the people who decide to work together to distribute copies among themselves and also to the public when they wish. And also make it's those who are programmers will be making changes. And that's how the group exercises its control. Is it possible to open any windows here? It's getting painfully hot. <laughs> I think this room wasn't designed to have so many people in it. Anyway, <clears throat> so with these four freedoms, we have both separate and collective control over the program and thus the social system of the program's distribution and use is an ethical one. But if any of these four freedoms is lacking or insufficient, then we, don't con we users don't control the program, which means the program controls the users and the program's owner or developer controls the program, which means that through this program, the developer or owner exercises power over its users. Thus, every non-free program generates a system of unjust power. That's why non-free software is an injustice. That's why it is user-subjugating software. And that's why non-free software should not exist. <clears throat> so, in the free software movement, 
we demand and work for freedom, which in our computing, which means all the software we use should be free. We want to escape from non-free software so that nothing will take away our freedom in our computers. If, you're, if all the software in your computer is free, then it all respects your freedom. If there is some non-free program in there, well, that is trampling your freedom. <clears throat> so in order to have freedom in what you do inside your computer, the software must be free. I started the free software movement in 1984. I wanted to make it possible to use a computer in freedom. It was impossible because the computer won't work without an operating system and all the operating systems then were proprietary so in order to have to get a computer and make it do anything you had to get a non-free operating system installed and there went your freedom. So to change that, I started developing a free operating system called GNU. It's spelled G-N-U, and this name is a joke, because that's the hacker spirit. No matter how serious the project is, you can still have fun by using a name that's a joke. GNU is a recursive acronym. It's spelled G-N-U, and it stands for GNU's Not Unix. So what does the G in GNU stand for? It stands for GNU. <laughs> but in order to be a joke, it needs to have two meanings. The recursive acronym is one meaning. The other meaning is this animal that lives in Africa. <laughs> so why GNU and not ANU, FNU, or SNU? Well, those are not words. But GNU is a word. Not only that, it's the most humor-charged word in the English language used for countless word plays because according to the dictionary, the G is silent and it's pronounced new. So every time you want to write the word new, you can spell it G-N-U and you've got a joke. Perhaps a little tired is a joke, but there are so many of them that we've been taught to associate this word with humor, which makes it the perfect name for any software project. So, in 1983, I announced the plan to develop the GNU system. And why say GNU's not Unix? Because it's a Unix-like system. It's compatible with Unix. Unix was a proprietary operating system with some nice features and it was popular. So by making a system compatible with Unix, I would have the same nice technical advantages and make it easy for people to switch. The of, that is, all the Unix users would be able to switch easily because using GNU would be just like using Unix. They would already know how to use my system. And then I recruited other people to join in developing it. And we started in January 1984. At that time, there were two of us. But it became dozens and then hundreds. I started the Free Software Foundation in 1985 to have a way to accept donations and give the donors a tax deduction. So we could spend this money on developing GNU. But most of the work was done by volunteers. By 1990, we had almost all of the necessary initial components of the system. One was missing, the kernel. Now, for all the major components, I tried to find some existing thing to start with, hoping that that would save work. And I did, that included the kernel. I, there was a kernel I was that was going to be made free, and I figured we'd start with that. But it turns out that didn't happen until 1990, so at that point we started developing our kernel based on Mach, which had been developed by Carnegie Mellon. But it, I had chosen 
a very advanced, elegant design, and perhaps that gave it too much of a research nature because it took us six years to get a test version of our kernel. Fortunately, we didn't have to wait for that because in 1992, Mr. Torvalds, who had written a proprietary kernel called Linux, liberated it, meaning he released the code under a free software license. At that point, Linux, the kernel, became free software, and since a kernel was all that was missing from the GNU system, people were able to put the almost complete GNU system together with Linux and make a complete system, <coughs> which was basically GNU, but also contained Linux. So it was the GNU system plus Linux, the GNU plus Linux system. Unfortunately, people got confused and started referring to this combination as Linux, basically giving us none of the credit. Well, that's not very nice. <laughs> so please don't do that to us. When you mention this system, of course now there's a lot in the system which didn't come from the GNU project or Linux, but it's still underneath its GNU plus Linux and lots of other stuff added on. So please call it the GNU plus Linux or GNU slash Linux system. Please give us equal mention. We did start it all. We did contribute the biggest share of the code, uh, bigger than any other project. So I think that's reason why you shouldn't omit us when you give credit. And, and fine, give credit to Mr. Torvalds also. He wrote an important component of the system. If you call it GNU slash Linux, then you're giving him equal mention to. And that's why I ask user groups that call themselves GNU, that call themselves Linux user groups to change their names because really they're groups of users of the GNU slash Linux system and they ought to say so. But this is not just about giving us credit. I mean, we deserve it, but this issue is not so important after all. Here's why the name matters. Because the names GNU and Linux are associated with different ideas, different philosophical principles. <clears throat> you see, the name GNU is associated with the free software movement, with the idea that users deserve freedom in what they do in their computers, that users should have control over the software. But the name Linux is associated with a different idea, which nowadays goes by the slogan of open source. In fact, that's the whole purpose of saying open source. In 1998, there were people in the free software community who liked the software and they participated in the activities of the community. Some were developers, some promoted the use of GNU slash Linux, but they all rejected the ethical idea that you deserve freedom and it's unjust to take that away from you. So they popularized, they coined the term open source in 1998 and popularized it so that our ethical principles would be forgotten. They didn't totally succeed because we've worked hard to keep awareness of free software alive, but they partly succeeded. Lots of people have heard of me and they write to me saying, I admire what you've contributed to open source. <laughs> What's the use? So I have to write back to them and say, I'm afraid there's been a misunderstanding. I don't agree with open source and I never did. I'm campaigning for free software for your freedom's sake. And people who say open source, they're they're, they reject what I stand for. I never did anything for open source, and I probably never will, because I would be failing to stand up for the cause of freedom if I did something under the rubric of open source. 
So I never do that. I figure there's so many things that would be useful for me to do. I can spend all my time working on those that fly the flag of free software, and it's, I still couldn't do as much as I wish. So why divert any of my time to activities that fly the open source flag? I don't. And you could also join in flying the flag of software Liberto as high as you can get it. And then we will spread awareness that this is an ethical issue, an issue of human rights. And that's what we need most. You see, open source presents it as a matter of convenience and nothing more. Well, why would anyone make a sacrifice for convenience? It would be dumb. It would be irrational to go to an inconvenience just to get a little convenience. You'd say, which convenience is bigger, right? But when it's freedom that's at stake, we understand that sometimes you have to make a sacrifice. So it's crucial if we want to make a strong movement that will overcome the adversaries that take away our freedom, that we spread the idea of regarding this as a matter of justice and freedom, something to fight for. <clears throat> now, your politics are up to you. If you support free software, I'm glad. If you support open source, you have a right to. But if you support the ideas of free software, please join us in spreading the word. Now, you'll come across terms FOSS and FLOSS. Those are ways of trying to mention both of these philosophical camps, political camps, and be neutral between them. Uh, the term FLOSS, free libra, and open source software actually is neutral. The term FOSS is not quite neutral. It makes open source, it promotes open source a little more than free software. Because free software is split apart and open source you can actually see. So if you want to be neutral, please say FLOSS. But if you're a free software supporter like me, being neutral is not the way to win for our campaign for freedom. So don't be neutral. Say software libero. Now, <clears throat> the most important place to insist on free software is in schools. But actually, there's another point I, that I should make first, that I should have made earlier, actually. Non-free software is distributed in an unethical social system. It's the way of distributing the software that's the injustice. There's a different thing that can be bad about a program, which we call malware. Malware means the program functions in a way is designed intentionally to function in a way that mistreats the users. So these are di totally different issues. Non-free software, is a, that question is about how the program is distributed. It's not about what the program does. Whereas malware is not about how the program is distributed. It's directly a matter of what the program does. But in practice, the two issues go side by side. Nowadays, Malware is very common in proprietary software products. That wasn't the case 30 years ago. 30 years ago, proprietary software at least functioned in an ethical way. The exceptions were rare and shocking, scandalous. Everybody would be, would be shocked to find out that a program mistreated the users. But now, the ethical standards have fallen so much that it's commonplace to find proprietary programs that are known to mistreat users, and it's hardly even a scandal. P 
people have gotten so browbeaten that they're used to being mistreated and stepped on all the time by their software and it, they hardly believe that they're entitled to anything better. At least that's the way it is with proprietary software. So what do these programs do? Well, there are programs that spy on the user. There are programs, well, no, those are called spyware. There are programs that are designed to restrict the user. This is digital restrictions management. There are also back doors. That means the program is ready to receive a command from somebody else to do something to the user. Something that the user might not like, but it won't tell the user. It won't ask permission either. And then there are proprietary programs that are platforms for censorship. In an abstract sense, you can think of this as a kind of DRM, but it's, in practice, it's so different, I think it deserves to be called a different category. We call these programs jails, because the users of the I things, when they found ways to, to uh, break the censorship, they called it jailbreaking. In effect, the users of the iThings recognize that the iThings are computers as jails. So I've adopted that term for computers that are platforms for censorship. And there, of course, Windows mobile devices are also jails. And some Android products are jails. <clears throat> Although not most of them. So, why is it so common to find that proprietary programs are malware? Because with a proprietary program, the owner or developer has power over the users. Well, they can calculate the amount of power they've got very finely. Nowadays, they're all aware of the power. They may start the project thinking about how they're going to mistreat their users. That'll be part of the business plan. Essentially, they constantly face temptation to put in the malicious functionalities because they know that the users can't remove them and maybe can't even find out about them. And most of the people who use non-free software are victims of known proprietary malware. Let me give you a list of examples to prove this. One proprietary package that has all four of these kinds of malicious functionalities is called Microsoft Windows. <laughs> Windows is literally malware. You will find when people use the term malware that often they have a strange blind spot but they use the term only for the programs that were not, that hurt the user, that were not intended to be in the computer. And they somehow fail to notice that the programs that were intended to be in the computer are just as bad if they're designed to hurt the user. But if we remove this strange bias, if we define as malware any program that was designed to hurt the users, then systems such as Windows that were supposed to be in the computer can be malware too. But Windows, by the way, Windows has a back door that is universal, meaning that Microsoft can forcibly install software changes, any software changes, without asking permission. And so any malicious functionality that is not in Windows today could be remotely installed tomorrow. So Windows is universal malware. Mac OS is malware because it has DRM, but the software of the iThings is much nastier. Several surveillance functionalities have been found in the iThings. It has DRM, it has an acknowledged backdoor, and it's a jail. So Apple's operating systems are malware. Flash Player is malware because it has a surveillance functionality and 
DRM. Angry Birds is malware. <laughs> it transmits geolocation information. The software in the Amazon Swindle is malware. The Amazon Swindle is an e-reader which, by its design, swindles readers out of the traditional freedoms of readers of books. For instance, there's the freedom to acquire a book anonymously, paying cash, such that no one knows what book you got. That's impossible with the swindle because Amazon makes users identify themselves. In fact, it does more spying. The swindle reports to Amazon what page of what book is being read at any time. If the user enters notes, Amazon gets the notes. And it's not just Amazon, by the way, that does this. Other commercial e-readers do it too. The EFF published a table after studying various products. Then there's the free, and by the way, the existence of a database saying which books people have read is in itself a threat to human rights. We must abolish that database. We can't tolerate its existence anywhere. Then there is the freedom to give the book to someone else after you've read it, or to lend it to various people when you wish, or sell it to a used bookstore. Amazon, with the swindle, abolishes those freedoms through DRM, together with disrespect for private property, because Amazon says that the user can't own a book. Amazon says, all of your books are belong to us. It makes users sign contracts saying that they don't own the book. All they have is a uh, is permission to read it under Amazon's conditions. This is also absolutely intolerable. I've never signed such an agreement, and I hope you never will either. Then there's the freedom to keep the book as long as you wish, which Amazon abolishes through the back door in the swindle. We know about it by observation. We can't study the code, after all. And the observation was that in 2009, Amazon remotely erased thousands of copies of a particular book, an Orwellian act. And what was the book? It was 1984 by George Orwell. So, yeah, that's the book that gave us the slogan, Big Brother is Watching You. But there was a lot of criticism, so Amazon promised it would never do this again unless ordered to by the state. If you've read 1984, that's not very comforting. <laughs> but don't worry, Amazon didn't keep that promise anyway. <laughs> so the official name of this product is the Kindle, which means to start a fire. Perhaps the point of that name is to suggest that the real purpose of the product is virtual remote burning of users' books. <laughs> but it will never get mine, because I will never use such a device. That device <coughs> makes people antisocial. What would it mean if your friends started using one? It would mean that your friend's not going to lend you books anymore. Not just to you, but to anyone. And that's antisocial. That's basically saying, I'm not anybody's friend anymore. Make sure your friends are aware of this before they start doing it. Make sure they understand that getting their books this way would mean breaking off their friendship with other people who read. Warn them so that they won't do it. That's the point. We don't want them to break off their friendships. We want them to understand why they shouldn't so they won't. So, <clears throat> the last example in my list is nearly all portable phones because the software in the portable phone, even if it's not a smartphone, it's a computer with software that can be changed not by you but by someone else and typically they will send the GPS location on remote command and you can't stop them and they have a universal back door that allows remote imposition of software changes 
And that has been used to convert them into full-time listening devices that listen 24-7 and transmit everything they hear. And you don't have to speak into the mic to be listened to. They can listen to you from across the room. And if you think you can get privacy by switching the phone off, surprise, surprise, it pretends to turn off, but it really keeps running and listening and transmitting. The only way to make it stop is to take out the batteries, all the batteries, and that may not be easy to do. There may be one obvious battery that you can remove and another not so obvious battery that you can't remove. And some phones don't let people remove any of the batteries. I wonder why. <laughs> when I realized that mobile phones were portable tracking and surveillance devices, that they were Stalin's dream, I realized I must not have one. There's some things we must not accept. Because it's every citizen's duty to stick a finger in Big Brother's eye. <laughs> I see that they're very convenient. But I'm not going to have one. <clears throat> So if I'm on a train and I, the train is late and I need to tell someone, I ask the other pa passengers, could you make a call for me? <laughs> and I find someone. And that way, Big Brother doesn't learn anything about me. <laughs> Big Brother just gets confused. <laughs> so. I've proved my point because almost everybody that uses proprietary software is using at least one of these examples. So I've proved that almost all users of proprietary software are using known proprietary malware. But what about free software? Malicious functionalities in free software are possible, but, and, but they're rare. And the reason is the contributors to a free program don't face the same temptation. We know that we don't have power over the users. We know whatever we put in, they can change. Therefore, it's easier for us to be ethical. We're not part of a commercial culture that says, make your business plan based on how you're going to mistreat people. So the result is, it's rare for free software to mistreat people. The users have a defense. The users of any given program can protect each other. Now, most of those users in most typically are not programmers, but some of them are programmers and they study the source code from time to time because they want to add a feature or fix a bug. But in the process, they have a chance to notice anything malicious and of course they'll they will start a scandal if they find anything malicious and they'll probably publish a modified version which is decent and honest and the prospect of this happening does not appeal to the contributors. It's to think, you, you know, if you know if I do something nasty to the users they'll be helpless, everyone else does it, they won't even resist. It's another thing to think if I put something in this that is nasty to the users, they'll find out, everyone will know it was me, they'll all condemn me, and they'll fix it, and that's not an attractive, tempting prospect. So, the, so for the users to have control over the software is our um, immune system against malware. It's the only known defense. It's not perfect. But it's much better than being defenseless like the users of proprietary software. So, schools and free software. Schools must teach exclusively free software. There should never be, they should never be teaching the use of non-free software. And this is not just to save money. That's a side benefit, a secondary benefit. We must be very careful not to present that as the main reason, because that's putting, uh, th that's getting the priorities backwards. 
This is not about how to make education run a little more efficiently. This is about how to do good education instead of bad education. Because teaching proprietary software is bad education, it's teaching people wrong. <clears throat> the school has a social mission to educate good citizens of a strong, capable, independent, cooperating, and free society. In the computing field, that means teaching free software and graduating users accustomed to free software and ready to be part of a free digital society. To teach the use of a proprietary program is implanting dependence on a particular entity. And that goes against the school's social mission. You should never do that. And why do some proprietary developers offer gratis copies to schools, gratis copies of their non-free programs. Because they want to use the school to implant dependence on their product. It's just like drug traffickers who say, try it, the first dose is gratis. <laughs> Once you're dependent, then you'll have to pay. Uh, of course, the school would reject the addictive drugs, even gratis and it should reject the proprietary software, even gratis. But, there's a deeper reason for the sake of the education of the best programmers. Some people have a natural talent for programming. At the age of 10 to 13, they have, uh, it's a little too loud. I think you better, it's, I think you better go out to talk because it's a bit loud. I think you should... Oh. <laughs> By the way, if you're carrying a portable tracking and surveillance device, please switch it off. They've already tracked you here. <laughs> we know, thanks to Snowden, that the NSA determines that two people know each other by seeing that their portable tracking devices are in close proximity. <laughs> So, <clears throat> at the age of 10 to 13, typically they become fascinated with computing, and they, if they use a program, they want to know, by the way, uh, don't take it personal. <laughs> if they use a program, they want to know how it works. But if if these kids ask the teacher, how does it do this? If the program is proprietary, the teacher can only say, I'm sorry, we can't find out because it's a secret. We're not allowed to know. Thus, education is not permitted. A proprietary program is the enemy of the spirit of education, so it should never be taught in a school. It should not be tolerated in a school, except in very special circumstances, reverse engineering. <laughs> but if the program is free, the teacher can explain however much he knows, then give each of these kids a copy of the source code saying, read it and you'll understand everything. And they'll read it because they're fascinated, they yearn to understand. The teacher can say, if you come across a point you can't figure out by yourself, show it to me and we'll figure it out together. That gives our natural born programmer the chance to learn a vital lesson. That code is not clear, it's badly written. If even a natural born programmer like you couldn't figure it out, it's very badly written, so don't write it that way. You see, to advance from natural born programmers to good programmers, they need to learn to write good clear code, which means they need to learn what's not clear, and this is how you learn it, the hard way. You try to figure out something and you see how hard it is to figure out and you realize this is not clear. And if you want to be a good programmer, you decide, I'm not going to write it this way. The way you learn to write good clear code is by reading lots of code and writing lots of code. Only free software offers the chance to read lots of code of real programs, large programs we really use. Then you've got to write lots of code. You've got to write code for large programs. But to do that well, you have to start small. 
how do you start small at writing code for large programs? Not by writing small programs, that's not even starting. No, you start by writing small changes in existing large programs. And only free software offers you the chance to write changes for small than bigger in existing large programs that we really use. Every school can offer the chance to master the skill of programming if it's a free software school. But there's an even deeper reason for moral education, education and citizenship. The school must teach the spirit of goodwill, the habit of helping others. Therefore, every class must have this rule. <coughs> Students, if you bring software to class, you may not keep it for yourself. You must share copies with the rest of the class and with everyone who wants one including the source code in case someone here wants to learn because this class is a place where we share our knowledge. Therefore, it's not permitted to bring proprietary software to class unless it's an object for reverse engineering practice. <laughs> the school, to set a good example, must follow its own rule. It must bring only free software to class, share copies including source code with all the class, except for reverse engineering practice. If you have a relationship with a school, if you are a student or a teacher or an employee or an administrator or a parent, it's your responsibility to campaign for that school to move to free software and to keep pushing until the school migrates. Don't treat it as legitimate for the school to be teaching non-free software or asking students to use non-free software. And again, if, if, if you are a teacher mainly, but students might have influence also, ask, typically, mostly in a university this would apply to, ask the university to set up a class in reverse engineering. And if they can't find an expert to teach it, well, they should have projects of four or five students as a group to try to figure it out. Because this is an area where we need more skills. We've got to build up our reverse engineering skills so we can figure out how to operate the hardware whose specifications are secret. Because right now, the only way to run that hardware is with non-free software. And that is our biggest obstacle. So this is the most important work we need, technical work we need to do. It's the reverse engineering and teaching more people to do it in the long term is the way to get more of it done. So the next threat to our freedom in the digital society comes, well the next three threats come from, from the internet. First of all, many websites send non-free software to the user's machine to run in the browser. And they don't warn the users even. They don't say, uh, this site is about to make non-free software run in your computer. These programs are included in web pages. Typically they're written in the language called JavaScript. That's just a detail, it doesn't really change anything ethically. Uh, the point is they're in the web pages, so you visit a page that page might load a non-free program into your browser and run it on your machine. So if you don't want non-free software running on your machine, you've got to block it. We have a program to do this in an intelligent way. It's called LibreJS. It analyzes the JavaScript code that pages try to install in your machine to see if these programs are either trivial or free. Because a program written in JavaScript can be free or non-free, just like a program in any other language. If it carries a free license and a pointer to the source, then it's free. Otherwise, it's not. So, LibreJS checks whether it's free and also checks for trivial things and allows them to run. But if the program is not free or trivial, then it's blocked and LibreJS warns you this page has some non-free programs in it. It has one other feature. It searches heuristically through the site to find how to complain 
to the site maintainers, to the webmasters. Because it's very important to complain. That's how we push them to change. But uh, people don't complain because it's so hard to complain. And the hardest part is finding how you're supposed to complain. So LibreJS does it for you. It says, I found these email addresses, these phone numbers, and, and this contact form. And then you can immediately complain. And it only takes a minute. You don't have to give a lot of details. You just say, I'm looking at such and such page. I can't do this because it requires running non-free JavaScript. Uh, please fix it so we can use your site. So if you send 10 complaints a day, you could do that in 10 minutes and you'd be helping our cause. The next threat that comes from websites and also from portals is that they could abuse the personal data they collect. <clears throat> now I refuse to connect to the internet through a portal that requires me to identify myself. I just won't. If a hotel says, enter your room number, nope. Now, if I know another guest who's willing to let, tell me his password for his room number, that'll do. Because that's not giving any accurate information to Big Brother. But I won't give my data that, that identifies me. But, of course, we know that many websites do surveillance on visitors and users. And it's worse than you might think. For instance, if you visit a page that has a Facebook like button in it, Facebook knows that your machine visited that page. How? The image of the like button comes from a Facebook server. And, fa and the server knows what IP address it sent the image to. And it knows which page it's for because the browser sends that information. So the Facebook server knows it sent the like button to this machine for this page. That's a system of surveillance that operates even on people who are not used of Facebook. I call them used, by the way, not users, because Facebook is the one that's using those people. But the point is, even if you've never had a Facebook account, Facebook is still doing surveillance on you unless you block the like button. Well, our browser, IceCat, blocks the like button and everything comparable. It blocks all third site material, third party material, basically. From anything that shows up in a page on site A that's coming from some other site is blocked. The new version that's coming soon will show you that something has been blocked. So if you really want to see it, you can. But that's a little more work. So these sites are collecting and sending off information constantly, but in addition, they get more personal information by asking you for it. And a lot of them ask for more data than they actually need in order to do whatever they're gonna do, just because they'd like to get more data about people. So once they have it, you can be sure that various governments are going to copy it. So they shouldn't be collecting it. That's the only real solution. Uh, and instead of funding themselves by advertising based on surveillance, we need an anonymous way to pay for some kind of service to websites that are forbidden to attempt to identify who's talking to them. There's, there should be legal limits on what data a website can keep. Now many websites uh, give information about their visitors to Google because they try to get statistics on how people visit the site using Google Analytics. Well, I understand that it's useful to find out how people, statistically how people visit the site, and that in itself is not bad. What's bad is giving data about all those people to somebody. So, what, well, giving or selling, I don't care. You see, whether they get paid for it is unimportant in terms of the ethics of how they're treating us. They may care what they get paid. We don't care rationally. 
Uh, so you shouldn't do, but in, in this case, it's not, uh, they're not getting paid by Google as far as I know. They might even be paying Google for giving them the statistics. The site can collect its own statistics using the free program PeeWeek. It'll collect the same statistics without sending them to any data to anybody and it can be configured so it doesn't even record the real IP addresses of the visitors. It only records hash codes, which is enough to collect the interesting statistics, but not enough to identify anybody. So, abuse of your data is another threat to your use of the internet. And then, there's an, of course, this threat people understand now in post Snowden times. But there's another way that services on the net attack your freedom that most people haven't even recognized. And that is, they offer to do your computing for you. And this is called SAS, Service as a Software Substitute. If you confide some of your own computing to somebody else's server, you lose control over what computing is being done. And that is an injustice. It's the same as the injustice of using a non-free program. With a free program, the users control the program. With a non-free program, the program controls the users. The users don't control that program. So if you do your computing by running a non-free program on your computer, you've lost control over what computing is being done and how. <clears throat> because it's the developer of the program that controls what it's going to do, not you, not other users either. Well, it's the same if you entrust that computing to somebody else's server. To use SAS means you send all the pertinent data to the server. That's mandatory. The server can't do the computing without the data. Of course, it will then abuse your data and the data could be snooped on by the NSA or some other government. But then the site does the computing and you don't control the programs that are run in that server. So you don't control how it's going to do that computing. It's the server owner who controls it. Or, if those are non-free programs, the server owner doesn't even control what they're doing, and the developers of those programs control it. If they're free programs, then the server owner has full control over what's going on in his server. But you don't. So either way, you are shafted. And then, in this scenario, it sends you the result, or else it takes action directly for you, based on this computing that it did that you don't control. So what this means is that running a non-free program and using SAS are two pathways to the same bad result, that you don't control your own computing. But what do I mean by your own computing? Well, your own computing means it's purely for you and doesn't involve anybody else. To distinguish it from joint computing activities, like communication between people, if you want to talk with me, that's not your activity, it's also not my activity, it's a joint activity. So neither one of us can say, I deserve full control over this. But if nobody else is involved, then it's purely yours. And then you could have control over it, so you should have control over it. In practice, here's a simple way to test whether something is your own computing. Could you do it inside your own computer if your computer were powerful enough and you had the right program? Could you at least in principle do it in your own computer? If so, it doesn't involve anybody else and it's your computing. Communicating with me, you couldn't possibly ever do inside your own computer because how would I get involved in it that way? It's going to have to involve my computer, too. So that's a joint activity. So this is the, the distinction. Joint activities, <coughs> no, no individual can expect to have full control over, but 
your personal activities, things that are your own, yes, you can, and so you should. That's where we've got to be aware of the injustice of SAS. So we say, don't SAS me. <laughs> So these are the three threats that come from services on the internet. The next threat to our freedom in the digital society comes from using computers for voting. You can't trust computers for voting because only an expert can tell if the machine was fiddled with so as to rig the election. And even the expert can't tell. Suppose it's election day, and a month ago, some experts studied the software that the machine uses, and they, they reported that the program looks correct, looked correct, and they believed it was honest. How do you know the program running in that computer today is the same program they studied? Maybe somebody installed the wrong version this morning, which is designed to make a certain candidate or party win, and tonight when the election's over, they will put back the correct program. At the, if people were voting through computers, all that there is at the end of the election is a set of totals. There's no way to verify that they are correct. You can't trust computers used for that. You can't trust them to maintain secret ballot either. People have shown with real live voting machines that are actually used in Brazil that it's possible to see how someone is voting from outside the building because computers emit electromagnetic waves which can be picked up and you can see what's on the screen that way. So these people show that they could, from outside the polling place, they could see the screen, they could see how someone was voting. Now, if there are 10 people voting at, every, at any moment, you may not know who you were watching. But if there are fewer voters, if there's only one person voting at a time, then you can figure out by seeing who goes in and out, who's voting at any time, and you can watch and take notes. Now, there are some who want to go even further to the total lunacy of voting over the internet. Now, this means that if you vote from a machine that's part of a botnet, the botnet will determine your vote. You might think you're voting for A, but the, the botnet sends a vote for B. Uh, Washington, D.C. proposed to, do, to let people vote over the internet and carried out a dry run inviting people to try to break their security. Well, a group of students arranged for a fictional robot to run the election, to win, to win the election. It's just nuts to allow internet voting because even if the computer security is all good, there's another <coughs> security hole in the system. What if your boss says, I want you to vote from my computer in my office while I watch you? can't allow that to happen. So, no internet voting, period. Uh, the next threat to our freedom in the digital society comes from the war on sharing. The war on sharing is the decades-long campaign of the copyright industry to stop us from getting the real use of our digital technology. Why is digital technology good and useful? Because it enables people to more easily copy, transmit, and manipulate data. But they don't want us to be able to make use of our digital technology. They want us to block us from sharing copies of published works. And they started this war with propaganda. They said, if you share, you're a pirate. Now that's, what are they saying when they call the people who share pirates? 
They're saying that helping others is the moral equivalent of attacking ships. Well, morally speaking, that's as false as could be because attacking ships is very bad, but sharing is good. So let's not call them both by the same name. They use other propaganda terms, which strictly speaking are false, such as they call sharing theft, they call it counterfeiting. We should denounce these propaganda terms. But, and so for instance, how do we reject them in the most visible possible way? It's good to make it a joke. So when people ask me what I think of piracy, I say attacking ships is very bad. If they ask me what I think of movie piracy, I say I liked the first Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> That's movie piracy for you. Uh, you could watch Captain Blood too. Although I suppose the movie's probably not as good as the book. <clears throat> But anyway, uh, if they had only used propaganda, I wouldn't call it a war, because they have the right to express their views. If they hadn't gone any further than that, it, any, any farther than that, it would be uh, legitimate for them to do so. But they did do much more. Then they started designing digital handcuffs into technological products. <coughs> <clears throat> perverting our, our technology into our prison guards, our handcuffs. And then, <clears throat> when that wasn't enough because people found ways to break the handcuffs, they started imposing unjust laws prohibiting breaking digital handcuffs and pro prohibiting telling people how to break digital handcuffs. In, it started in the US but then spread to Europe and other countries. In Italy, because it's, it, this is so in the entire European Union, it's forbidden to, uh, at least in some circumstances, distribute programs that can break digital handcuffs. Now the directive only requires countries to prohibit commercial distribution, but most of them have gone further and prohibited non-commercial distribution also. Well, we've got to get rid of those unjust laws. But, they didn't stop there. Then they began suing teenagers for hundreds of thousands of dollars for sharing, or possibly sharing. And then, <clears throat> they started getting rid of the fundamental principle of justice. No punishment without a fair trial. Because they're pushing laws that punish people for merely being accused of forbidden sharing. And they have such laws in countries such as the UK and the United States has imposed them on some other countries such as Colombia and South Korea and, uh, and more. <clears throat> but they're not going to stop there. In Japan, there's a punishment of two years in prison for downloading an unauthorized copy of something from the net. So if you download 10 songs, you could be imprisoned for 20 years. <laughs> Uploading is punished with five years imprisonment. If this isn't enough, I suppose they'll start executing people who are accused of sharing because they're determined to put an end to this form of cooperation and thus preserve their stranglehold no matter what it takes. Now, we've seen digital handcuffs in various kinds of media. First it showed up in music and then in video. Actually, video may have been the first really because it showed up in DVDs. And then it showed up in music on the internet and in books. 
as in the Amazon swindle. DRM was mostly removed from music around 10 years ago, but it's coming back in so-called streaming services. And using those makes you antisocial. If you don't have a copy that you could share with friends, that's being antisocial. Out, out, damn Spotify. You must not be seduced into using those kinds of services that make you cease to be a friend of other people that like music. Make sure you've got a copy without DRM. Of course, this applies to any kind of media, not just to music, but music is where the threat is biggest. <clears throat> now, it's no accident that they have used a series of nasty and draconian measures. Sharing is good, and with digital technology, sharing is easy unless they stop you. So of course people share. And the only way to stop people from sharing is with some nasty, draconian, unjust measure. So they try a series of nasty, draconian, unjust measures, and they'll keep trying more until we stop them completely by legalizing sharing, by putting an end completely to the war on sharing. We have to recognize that sharing published works is everyone's right and may not be interfered with. So, <clears throat> so we should legalize sharing. This is one of several changes I believe we should make in copyright law. We also, we should ban digital restrictions management. We should say whatever rights the users have under copyright law, technology cannot be used to deny those to the users. We have to legalize remix. Remix means you take some pieces out of various works and put them together into something new with a different idea, a different purpose. It's not the same thing as making a modified version, by the way, because the spirit of it is different. The remixed work is a different work with a different overall purpose. And since the purpose of copyright law is to encourage creativity, making more works, well, it shouldn't be interpreted in a way that makes it an obstacle to that activity. That's perverse. Copyright should not last so long. Uh, 70 years after the author's death is nuts. I think copyright should last for 10 years from the date of publication of the work. That's a period of time you could wait. And then, <clears throat> We should also ban the end user license agreements that take away from people the rights they would have under copyright law. Now there are certain works I believe must be free. Those are the works that are designed to be used in practical ways. We can call them functional works, practical works. What are they? Well, computer programs, recipes, educational works, reference works, fonts for displaying paragraphs of text, uh, 3D printer patterns for functional useful objects as distinguished from decorative ones. So the same argument that applies to software applies to any functional practical work. Freedom is having control of your own life. If you use a work to do activities in your life, having control of the activity requires that you have control over the work. So the works that are meant to, for practical use, the user should have control over them. And that requires the same four freedoms for whatever kind of work it might be. However, there are also works that present a point of view and there are artistic or entertainment works. They're not meant for practical use. 
So the situation's different. I don't think that those have to be free. If I did, I would be obliged to put my speeches under free licenses too. But uh, because they state a, p a point of view, I think it's a different kind of issue. And likewise for art. I wouldn't say that, that those works must be free, but people have to be free to share them. Now, sharing is another word I use with a precise meaning. It means non-commercial redistribution of exact copies of the work. So it doesn't include commercial use, it doesn't include uh, modification. Those are the things that copyright can legitimately cover for a certain period of time, for those kinds of works. <clears throat> now, when the copyright industry companies demand more power over us and demand draconian measures to enforce that power, they say it's for the artists, which is nonsense. Uh, because they are mistreating those same artists all the time, with the exception of a few, the stars. They treat the stars pretty nicely. But the rest of the artists, they grind into the ground with their heels. They say that if you share music, you're stealing from the musicians, but that's bullshit. It's the record companies that stole from the musicians, and they didn't leave anything for you to possibly take, even if you tried. <clears throat> so oh, so they're, what they're saying is bogus. It's an excuse to maintain the power they shouldn't have. But there is one aspect of truth in it. If we want arts, we better support artists. But that doesn't mean we have to be subject to the war on sharing. There are other ways we can support artists. Now, one other way is already used. Uh, for instance, there are government agencies that give out funds to artistic activities, but there are drawbacks to having bureaucrats decide what art to support. Uh, the copyright system at least claims to support artists based on their popularity. Well, I can propose two other ways to support artists based on their popularity without letting bureaucrats decide anything. One, it would be administered by the state. The state would collect money to use to support artists based on the popularity of each artist, which would be measured either by, uh, by polling people, you know, you offer people the chance for this year to contribute uh, a list of what you have read, watched, and listened to, uh, which will be disconnected from your name. Or it could be done by counting how frequently various works are shared in the peer-to-peer -peer networks. And other ways can be imagined. But once you've got a popularity figure for each artist, how much money does that artist get? Well, the obvious way is linear proportion. If A is twice as popular as B, A gets twice as much money. If A is a star and is a thousand times as much as good and appreciated artist B, then A would get a thousand times as much money. Well, this shows that linear proportion is not a good way because it, it would give most of the money to some stars who don't really need more, and it wouldn't do much good for supporting the medium popularity artists or the ones where more support would do a lot of good, where it's really needed. So, my solution is take the cube root of the popularity figure and distribute the money in proportion to the cube roots. The cube root function looks like this, basically. It rises fast and then tapers off. It keeps on rising, it never stops rising, but it rises more and more slowly. And the cube root of a thousand is ten. So if A is a, a is a star and is a thousand times as popular as good and appreciated art as B, with linear popularity, with linear proportion, A will get a thousand times as much money as B. With the cube root, A will get ten times as much money as B. So the effect of the cube root is to shift most of the money from the stars to a lot of medium popularity artists. And the artists that nobody appreciates will still get very little, 
and the st each star will get more than a less popular artist, but not, and not, not astronomically more. So this way the system will do a good job of supporting medium popularity artists, the stars being much fewer in number, even though each one gets maybe ten times as much, that'll be less money than the, you know, the stars will only get a, f a small fraction of the money. Most of it will go where it's really doing good. Of course, cube root's not the only function we could use. I'm not claiming it's the perfect function or the best function. It's an example. I wouldn't complain if this were done with the fourth root or the uh, 3.5th root or some other function of that shape. Uh, the other method is with voluntary payments. Suppose each player had a button you could push and it would send a certain sum anonymously to the artist. How much? Well, in Italy today, perhaps 10 euro cents might be a good amount. If it's too small, it just won't add up to much. And if it's too big, people will hesitate to send it. So there's got to be some optimal size of payment which would maximize what people send. Each country, I suppose, would fix the amount to try to maximize, as best as they can figure, the total amount people will send. And then you can push the button or not. It's up to you. No one will punish you or harangue you if you don't. But if you do, you'll feel good. And since it's a small amount of money, you can afford it. In fact, I suppose each of you could send 10 cents to some artist once a day without begrudging the 36.5 euros a year that you would lose. Now, there are probably people in Italy who can't afford 36 euros a year, and they won't send it, and that's fine. We don't need to squeeze money out of poor people to support artists. There are enough non-poor people who will be happy to do it. In fact, why don't you do it now? Because it's too hard. If you're standing in front of an artist who's performing, yeah, you can give money. Otherwise, it's too hard. It's inconvenient. There is no effective way to send uh, such a small sum on the internet and you'd have to find where to send it which isn't easy either. But in fact there are artists that are supported by voluntary payments. Sometimes they have a website and they say please give money. Now they're not asking for 10 cents, they're asking for much more. They might say oh, if you give $50 I'll send you a fancy CD case with a CD in it. And if you give uh, $1,000 then uh, you can interview me for an hour. And if you give $5,000, well, hmm. Uh, the point is, it works. And then there's crowdfunding, which seems to work better every year. Unfortunately, the crowdfunding sites require running non-free software. So I couldn't endorse any project on those sites. But, <clears throat> Sooner or later, we'll fix that problem somehow. So, we know that voluntary payments can work. And just as the copyright industry spews vile propaganda insulting people who share, we could have kind, friendly public relations announcements inviting people to give. Did you send 10 cents to an artist today? If you listened to or read or watched something that you liked, push the button. You'll be amazed at how good it feels. So, <clears throat> the next threat to our freedom comes from the fact that in the virtual world, you don't have the right to do anything. Whatever you do, you do on sufferance, as long as certain companies are willing to cooperate. And if they stop, you're gone. It's as if 
some company owned the land between your front door and the street. And in order to get onto the street, you had to get that company's permission. And if that company said, we don't like you anymore, you can't get out. Now, if you have a position, something you want to say to people, you can write it on a piece of paper, and you can walk around in the street with your piece of paper. You don't need any company to approve that. It's your right. But if you want to do the same thing in the virtual world, in the digital society, you need the cooperation of an ISP and a domain name registrar and a hosting company. And those companies can kick you out. And they can do it effectively arbitrarily because they decide their terms of service, they can change their terms of service, and they decide whether you violated their terms of service. They don't even need to convince a judge that you really violated the terms of service. They are judge, prosecutor, and executioner. We saw this in the case of WikiLeaks, when the US government decided to kick WikiLeaks off the internet. Now, it didn't prosecute WikiLeaks, Apparently, WikiLeaks had not committed any crime. There, was no, there were no grounds for prosecution, but the U.S. wanted to kick WikiLeaks off the net even without prosecution, extrajudicially. So first, uh, WikiLeaks had rented an Amazon virtual server, so someone intimidated Amazon, and Amazon then announced that it had judged that WikiLeaks was violating the terms of service and disconnected WikiLeaks' server. Then they went after the domain names that WikiLeaks had and got a lot of them revoked, but they couldn't get rid of WikiLeaks.ch. Then they went after the payment companies that volunteers used to send contributions to WikiLeaks. And it, through intimidation, PayPal and Google and MasterCard and Visa and the Bank of America and others all said that they refused to send any money to WikiLeaks. And then there was a business in Iceland that used credit cards to get payments from its customers, which said it would accept donations on behalf of WikiLeaks. So the credit card companies cut off payments to that company, too. This shows what kind of thing happens. Now, in the US, they couldn't pass a law punishing people with disconnection just because they're accused of sharing, because the US Constitution is too, uh, too explicit and too well, up, too well upheld, such a law would be obviously unconstitutional. So Obama arranged an agreement between the five major ISPs, and most people have no other choice, and the copyright industry, where the ISPs promise to punish their own customers. And they can do this because the customers have no rights. <clears throat> well, and then, so what this shows is all our activities in the digital society are vulnerable until we have an affirmative right to do the things we should be able to do. We need to legislate that if you sign up for an internet service of any kind, whether it's an ISP or a virtual server or a payment processor or whatever, that they can't change the rules on you, and that as long as you follow the rules, they can't cut off your service, and if they think you've broken the rules, they've got to <coughs> prove it in court before they can cut off your service. It should be like renting an apartment. Yes, if you don't pay your rent, you'll eventually be kicked out. But the landlord can't just say, I don't like you anymore, out. 
We've got to establish rights for people in the digital society. So, now I'll tell you where to get some more information about free software. Look at GNU.org and FSF.org, which, oh, no more, no more, I've got that. FSF.org, which is the Free Software Foundation, has uh, campaigns that you can sign, please do, and resources that are useful. And you can also become a member through FSF.org if you're willing to do e-commerce. But since I'm here, you have the opportunity of signing up in person. There is also the Free Software Foundation Europe, which is FSFE.org, and there may be someone here who can accept membership sign-ups in person. That way you can pay your dues in cash and uh, not be tracked. But anyway, <clears throat> um, now it's time for the auction of the adorable <laughs> GNU, which needs a home. I'm, uh, so I'm going to auction this for the benefit of the Free Software Foundation. If you have it, if you, oh, this one doesn't have a card. It somehow got lost, but it has a label I can sign if you like. If you have a penguin at home, you need to get a GNU for your penguin. Because <laughs> as we all know, a penguin can't hardly function without a GNU. <laughs> um, <clears throat> When you bid, please wave your arm and shout the amount so I can hear you. I have hearing problems. Uh, and please be quiet when you're not bidding. And we can accept payment with cash or credit cards, as long as the credit card can make international purchases by phone, because I don't have a chip machine here. And uh, we can also accept payment in Bitcoin if somebody has a means of connecting to fsf.org to do donate to Bitcoin, but the bids have to be in Euro. And I'm gonna start with its normal price, which is around 20 Euro. So, do I get 20 Euro or more? How much? 25. I've got 25, do I get? 30. I've got 30, do I get 35? 35 or more Euro? For this adorable GNU, 35 or more. It's, I've got 35. Do I get 40? I can't hear you. 40. 45. I've got 45. I've got 15. Do I get 55? Look, it's an auction. Of course, I asked for people. How much? How much? 60. I've got 60. Do I get 65? <coughs> I've got 60. Do I get 65 or more? <coughs> what? You don't miss 60. You don't have 60 yet. <laughs> I've got a bid of 60. Do I get 65, 65 or more for this adorable <laughs> that needs a home? 65 or more to the Free Software Foundation to defend freedom? 70. I've, who? 70. I've got 70. Do I get 75 or more? <clears throat> 75 or more for this adorable... <laughs> <laughs> this pre kissed 70. This is not free. How much? <laughs> I, don't, I don't care how you're going to pay. You can go to a cash machine and get money out. There'll be time. So I've got how much? Uh, I've got 75. Do I get 80 or more? 80 or more for this adorable GNU? 80 or more to the Free Software Foundation to defend freedom? 80. Who? 80. I've got 80. Do I get 85? 85. I've got 85. Do I get 90? I've got 85. Do I get 90 for this adorable GNU? I remember you have I, I, no matter where I am, I'm going to keep asking for higher bids until I don't get one. That's what an auction is. I've got 85. Do I get 90? 90 euros for this adorable canoe? 90 or more. Last chance to bid 90 or more for this adorable canoe. Last chance. 
Going, going, gone for 85. <laughs> It's going to be a bit complicated. Uh, I will do, I'll handle that after the questions. If that's okay. Can you wait until after yes, the questions? Yes. Good. So, questions. Uh, there is a, I asked those, is it logic that the uh, game to uh, rebuild from scratch uh, the empty kernel of uh, Microsoft? Yeah, but it doesn't aim to run with purely free software. We've looked at it. But uh, if they made a system that was entirely free software, we would recognize it as such. They are doing it. Oh, they are? Yeah. Oh, well, because in the past when we looked at it, they, ha they weren't even trying. They if they do that, that's fine. If they want to be listed as a free system, they should write to us. We have stated criteria for listing a system. If they meet it, meet the criteria, we can list them. They have to write to us. Other questions? Hello? Yes. How do you personally look at the, the movement, the revolution, the it's called awakening that you have such a big part in starting. Well, I started it, basically. It's that simple. But in terms of how do I see it now, well, we've made tremendous progress. I would say on a logarithmic scale, we've got about halfway. Uh, because there are tremendous problems and obstacles uh, obviously, most people are using proprietary software. And then there are the, there's the hardware we can't support because its, um, it's mode of use is a secret. Now, I, do, I think that that shouldn't be allowed. I think anyone selling some hardware should be required to publish how you run that hardware. You work a long time. And I still remember when I was first exposed to Unix, uh, when there was that beautiful book uh, made in Australia regarding, you remember? Unix. I don't remember. I didn't use Unix back yeah, then. There was a book, Unix yeah. version 6, mm -hmm. which was which actually uh, re uh, required AT&T to start distributing as open source the, the Unix. Sorry, I'm not a supporter of open source. I don't want us to discuss open source no, I except to criticize it, I'm sorry. <laughs> what, what I was trying to say is that uh, uh, your request uh, and uh, your aim, which is not only valid and legitimate, uh, uh, requires a lot of knowledge which is not common. That's you okay. Know? Writing software requires knowledge. Why is this a problem? Uh, you know, if you really want to have an impact, you need a lot of people that are very... We have a lot of people. What's the issue? <laughs> by the way, that Lions book was not authorized by AT&T. No, I know, I know it was not authorized. Yeah. That's the reason why they have to, to, to change their licensing. Well, there. the point is, no, no, the point is that AT&T didn't, didn't change to give permission for it. It clamped down harder. AT&T did not per respond to that by distributing source code or permitting anything, just the opposite. AT&T responded to the Lions book by being harsher in its distribution and taking more care to make everyone sign a license. In 1984, when I started developing GNU, BSD was Berkeley's version of Unix, and it, the source code from Berkeley was available only to those who could show an AT&T source license, which was very expensive, something like $50,000, I believe. I so uh, it's a mistake to think that Unix in some way contributed 
to what we did. Unix was a proprietary, unethical operating system. I decided to adopt Unix as the pattern to follow technically for technical reasons after I had decided to develop a free operating system because there was none. And by the way, when I made that decision, I had never used Unix. I was not a Unix fan. Other questions? No. I would like to know what you think about uh, building a mesh network uh, uh, to bypassing censorship uh, the, by the... Well, it's hard to bypass censorship with a mesh network because your mesh network would probably have to reach outside the country you're in. Yeah. And see, that's the big difficulty with trying to substitute for the internet. It's easy to do that in a small geographical area, but it doesn't do you much good. And it becomes hard to do it worldwide. What's your opinion on Tor? Um, technically, I'm not in a position to evaluate it. Uh, the job, it, 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 in, in its spirit, it's a very good thing. Thank you. I'm working in the field of education. In I can't hear you. Hello? Yeah? It works? You turned it off, or he turned it off. Yeah, let me see. NSA. Okay, it works. I'm working in the field of education, and okay, we are trying to use um, free software. Uh, most of us, we are users, we are not developers. So one of the problems that I find sometimes is if you. <coughs> Free software is okay because you can handle your software, you can modify, you can develop for free. If you could get straight to the problem. Yes, yeah. the problem is that sometimes, at least this is one of the problems that I found it, is that there are developers that are paid so much to give you assistance to use correctly the software that, I mean, a normal user is not able to use some specific free software because they don't have the knowledge and the people with the well, knowledge, they ask so much money. So well, there are people who will, there are other users who will try to help you. I mean, I can't say that all free software has been developed wonderfully. There, it depends on which package it is. Uh, on the other hand, you might be able to get some project going to improve a particular free program's usability. Um, you haven't said which program, so what can I say? Grass. What? Grass. Uh, well, I know that grass is very widely used. Yeah. I've never seen it myself. I don't do that sort of thing. But there, the user community is so big that there's a chance of finding users to combine funds to improve its usability. I think it will be user to give training and assistance at a reasonable price. I have price. no idea. Yeah. I, I don't know the developers. <laughs> but the point is, training and assistance is obviously not as nice as making the program easy to use. Since I've never seen that program, it's, I'm not, it's, it's not useful to me. I'm not in that field. I can't begin to judge how much room for improvement there is. There might be some. Ok. Allora, noi vi, vi ringraziamo, crediamo sia stato un appuntamento molto interessante. Io farei ancora un applauso a.